Redis is one of my favorite pieces of software. It's something that is so simple to run. I run it in a Docker container locally. Its API is super straightforward. It has all these really useful commands. And the thing is bulletproof. I can't think of a time where we had an outage caused because Redis went down. It just... Very interesting question. Um, I would normally want to answer when to use Redis by saying when you not want to use Redis, but I have, I know of a guy who has a company and they use Redis as their data store for all their applications and that's it. And they know better. They know you shouldn't do that, but they do. And they've been going for a number of years and have made millions of dollars and it works for them. So I'm not going to say that that's enough to say that's when you should that you should also do Redis, but it is pretty amazing what that software can do. Redis is one of my favorite pieces of software. It's something that is so simple to run. I run it in a Docker container locally. Its API is super straightforward. It has all these really useful commands. And the thing is bulletproof. I can't think of a time where we had an outage caused because Redis went down. It just chug, chug, chugs. And we beat the hell out of it at HipChat. That pretty much ran all of HipChat is Redis, and Redis never failed us once. It just kept going and going and going. Even though you think that, oh, Redis is an ephemeral database, uh, meaning that the data could go away at any moment. If the power goes out, you lost the last, I think up to a minute, it's configurable, but up to a minute, you lost that much data. So it's not a good job. It's not a good idea to make Redis your primary data source, but Outside of something like that, Redis just doesn't go down. It is very impressive as far as its ability to work. Simple little single instance, single CPU instance of a service. It just, it's really single threaded, it's really simple, and it crushes it as far as performance goes. So Suiku asks, what are some instances where you'd use Redis? The common one where you'd use Redis is caching. So let's say you have an application and you make a query back to the database to retrieve books, a list of books, and you do that a lot. Accessing the database is gonna be somewhat fast, but if you have to do it a bunch, it's gonna put a lot of load on your database and databases are very hard to scale. So the common one to work around database performance issues is to add a caching layer. The logic goes, you have a request for books and you first go to the cache, go to Redis and say, do you have the list of books? And they give you back the list of books and you return it to the customer. And that happens within a millisecond or so. Uh, yeah, I think it's like about a millisecond or so. If they don't have the list of books, you about go to the database, query the list of books, store it back into Redis for next time, and then return the list of books back to the client. That can make your application much faster because now you're doing all of your reads from a data source that is crazy fast. The reason why Redis is very fast, there's several reasons, but one of the reasons is because all of the information is stored in memory. Redis is not going to the database to do any information retrieval. So anytime you're getting information from memory, even nowadays with the fast SSDs, it's still faster to get it straight from RAM. That's also one of the disadvantages of Redis is you can't put anything in everything. If you have a database, you can store terabytes of information. Unless you have terabytes of RAM, you can't put that in Redis. So Redis is really good for caching frequently used pieces of data, things that you might need to query hundreds, thousands of times a second, Redis is gonna be able to handle it. Redis is also good for atomic operations in a limited kind of way. You can put something into Redis and know that you're not gonna have a concurrency problem where you're putting it in while someone's reading it and you need a lock or a read lock or read write lock, things that you'd have to do in a database, which is why database has those kind of locks Databases have transactions, databases have all these different structures to deal with concurrency. In Redis, it is a single threaded application. So while your request is coming in retrieving data, all the other requests are just sitting there waiting. Then once it's done, the next request goes in. You'd think that would make it slow, but Redis is so fast because again, it's accessing information in memory that those operations happen super quick. That's also why it's able to be atomic because only one request can be processed at a time. So they have a number of operations that they expose on their API, such as adding something to a list, removing something to, from a list, peeking at a list, creating maps of data, things like that, that are all atomic. And then you can go even farther and you can write Lua scripts that will run inside of Redis 
to do multiple complex operations all within a transaction. But again, remember, it's not a transaction in a database sense. It's just a transaction in the sense that the op set of operations is guaranteed to be atomic, meaning it won't get partially done and then die and you're left with some middle ground state. And the reason why it's so easy for Redis is again, it's single threaded. So only one thing can be happening at once. For an example of using Lua is in HipChat, we had a rate limiting algorithm where we wanted our API not to allow infinite requests because guess what? As soon as you have a public API and you get somewhat popular, there's gonna be somebody somewhere who writes a script, either intentional or more often non-intentional that hammers the hell out of your API, hits your database, brings it down, brings your whole application down. And so what they wanted is a rate limit thing, which said you can only run this many operations every second. I think in the in HipChat case, it was 10,000 requests every five minutes. After five minutes, we wanted the, the API key to get another, I think it was 5,000, did I say 5,000? Let's say 5,000, 5,000 requests. Now, we, now, in order for that algorithm to be working, you need to be able to retrieve the rate limit. You have to retrieve how many requests that person has done, calculate if they have any left, auto increment a number to keep track of this new request and then return. So it's, it's not a ton of logic. I think it was like 10, 20 lines of Lua. It wasn't a lot, but you wanted all that to happen atomically. You don't want it to get partway through and then something else comes in and, and changes things. So we were able to write a little Lua script that we were able to upload into Redis. And so whenever we called this Lua script via Redis, very similar to a stored procedure in database, if you've ever done those, we were able to get that read limit, have everything auto increment, and then have that operation work. And because it's in Redis, it was very, very fast. And that saved our butts because we had a few outages where we had somebody hitting us for with so many requests that it brought us down. And once we put that in place, we were able to prevent those those types of things from happening. Yeah, it was fascinating. Um, I mean, not to get too much into that, but in HipChat, because it was a chat tool, much like Slack, if for those who don't know, sadly, it kills me to say this, HipChat is like Slack, where HipChat came first. So that's why it kind of kills me a little bit, but whatever. It's a chat tool. So what was interesting is we would have people who would use HipChat as their logging system. So their application logs would go straight into a message in a channel because you could post a message in a channel with a simple webhook. And so they would put that into their application and actually log all of their logs into HipChat and then use HipChat search so that they could search their logs, uh, which is freaking crazy uh, the more you think about it. But it's pretty clever on their part because basically they get log hosting and log searching for free because at that point most of the accounts were free and we didn't have uh, limits on it or anything like that. So I don't know. Anyways, long story short, and that's just one of many I can talk about HipChat. But the one thing I'll, that I learned from that is always have limits. Anything in your system, have a limit, even if that limit is crazy high, because if your application is public and popular in any kind of way, guaranteed you, someone is going to exceed that limit and you don't want to be stuck with it because that's actually what happened to HipChat. We had a customer who would put 20,000 people into a chat room at once, but because we had no limit for that, we allowed it. And that became a key part of how that company ran, except they would continually bring our back end down because we were not built for that many. We were built for maybe 5,000, actually really about a thousand people in a channel at most, but we didn't want to kick the customer out and tell them they can't do it. And so we kept doing it and we had a bunch of outages and, and we ended up getting a reputation for being a very unstable service. Uh, and a, admittedly deserved reputation because we weren't able to say no. It's really important for an application that you say no. And the sooner that you define those limits, the places that you say no in your application, the easier it's going to be for your application as it scales and gets popular. So Redis. Redis is really good for caching, um, for atomic operations like that, doing the rate limiting that we did in HipChat. It's also good for communication. So many people use Redis as a very simple pub sub system. And by pub sub, I mean, let's say that you have servers that are interested in someone public buying a book and you have other servers where people buy books. What you can do is you can have the servers that want to know about people buying books, subscribe to a topic. I want to know about people buying books. And over here, the servers, when someone buys a book, they publish to that topic and say, here's a book someone bought and automatically all these people listening on that topic can get it and go do whatever they want. Uh, maybe tweet that somebody bought their book. I don't know. 
So Redis can be used as a messaging system. You can communicate with Redis by putting things on a topic. And then over here, you can connect to a, basically you're connecting to a list and you're being notified. It'll just sit there and block and you'll be notified whenever that list has something on it and then you can go do it. You can use that for um, PubSub, as I mentioned, you can use it for job queuing where you have uh, a job like sending an email that you don't wanna do on the request thread, you wanna do that separately. And so you can use Redis to publish jobs onto it. There's a number of job frameworks such as Huey, which is built on Redis. There's RQ, which is another messaging system built on Redis. Um, a number of popular ones for your different languages because the primitives, Redis provides the primitives and then you have a library that puts the application logic on top of that. It's a pretty amazing piece of software.